Hey everyone, welcome to chapter six, nonverbal communication. During this presentation, I would invite you to reflect on how you use your body language to communicate. In this lecture, we'll cover the characteristics of nonverbal communication, the functions of nonverbal communication, and the various types of nonverbal communication. So let's go ahead and get started with the characteristics of nonverbal communication. So how do we define nonverbal communication? Well, we know that nonverbal communication are messages expressed by non-linguistic means. The reason why we study nonverbal communication is because scholars in the past have found that 93% of the emotional impact of a message stems from nonverbal sources. So it's, you know, supporting that saying, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Now, I would argue that what you say and how you say it equally matters. So this stems from this idea that we believe what we see. And this probably plays out true in your own relationships and communication interactions. For example, you might see a friend and ask, hey, how are you? And you notice they look sad or they aren't, you know, their normal happy self. And they respond, oh, I'm fine. Are you going to really believe th what that, that spoken message is? I'm fine. No, you're going to take in all those nonverbal cues that your friend is illustrating and arrive to the conclusion that something's up. So all nonverbal behavior has communicative value. So as we alluded to in previous uh, lectures, this includes your style, so the clothing you choose to wear. It could be facial expressions. It could be your body posture, how you conduct yourself around uh, different social contexts. All of these behaviors have communicative value, right? So people are going to interpret your behavior whether we realize it or not. So characteristics of nonverbal communication. Essentially, nonverbal communication is primarily relational. That means that to be able to accurately interpret someone else's behavior, there has to be some sort of relationship with them. So think about your close relationships. You can interpret uh, your best friend's behavior fairly accurate. Right. Or think about, you know, in the workplace, even though you might not have a strong connection with your coworkers, that context, that relationship that you have with your coworkers influences the type of nonverbal communication you engage in and how you interpret their behavior as well. So, again, some key examples would be interacting with your employer. Right. So maybe a firm handshake is acceptable or professional attire. Since the whole COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I think we'll see less handshakes uh, within the professional context. Think of how you greet a friend, you know, maybe hugs, a secret handshake. You probably uh, wear relaxed attire when you're amongst uh, friends or, you know, how you interact with a romantic partner, you know, kisses, uh, you know, symbolic representations of uh, commitment, such as wedding rings or, you know, holding hands. All of these nonverbal behaviors are influenced based on the relationship we have with uh, the people around us. So what makes verbal and nonverbal communication differently besides the fact that nonverbal communication is expressed by non-linguistic means, whereas verbal communication is vocalized communication? Well, these are some comparisons between the two that illustrate some unique differences. So we see on the left, verbal communication, that first bullet point, is mostly voluntary and conscious. So to be able to speak, that is a very voluntary uh, behavior. And we have to be conscious in order to speak, uh, you know, something uh, coherent. Whereas nonverbal communication is, we're often unconscious of the messages that we send through our body. So think how you're sitting right now. You know, take, take a moment and reflect 
what type of messages would my body be giving off? Now, that's something that we don't actively reflect on every waking moment of our lives. But I encourage you as a competent communicator to uh, be more in tune to the nonverbal behaviors and the type of messages you might be implicitly um, communicating to others around you. On the left-hand side, the second bullet point under verbal communication, we see that verbal communication tends to be uh, focused on the content of the message, whereas the nonverbal communication tends to be focused on the relationship between the individuals. We see that verbal communication can be clear or vague. So that's something we discussed last chapter with the abstraction ladder. So we, we see that language can be very abstract and fuzzy and vague, or it can be very precise and clear. The thing is with nonverbal communication is it is inherently ambiguous. That means there is no clear meaning associated with our nonverbal behaviors, right? So just because I'm wearing this doesn't mean anything. Or just because maybe I'm standing or sitting in a particular position doesn't accurately communicate maybe what I'm feeling. We see that verbal communication is primarily shaped by culture, so language. Whereas our nonverbal communication is really rooted in our biology. So later in this lecture, we'll cover the seven universal facial expressions. And so nonverbal communication tends to be rooted in our biology, but it is influenced through cultural norms. You know, what is appropriate or inappropriate when interacting with society. So, you know, for example, we see that, you know, in Western societies, you know, a handshake during a business meeting is perfectly acceptable. Uh, that's the appropriate way to greet someone in a professional context. Whereas in Asian communities such as uh, Japan, it would be a head bow. Um, that would be the way non-verbally we would greet each other in a professional context. So we see that there are cultural um, influences on what's appropriate or inappropriate. We see that verbal communication can be discontinuous and intermittent. So that means that we can stop talking. We can choose when to start talking. It's not this continuous stream of language. Whereas our nonverbal communication, such as our body posture, how we're sitting, the way we look, our eye contact, we can't necessarily turn that off. So that is a continuous stream of transmitting messages to the rest of the world. So we see that verbal communication is a single channel. We primarily rely on words and language to communicate meaning, where nonverbal communication tends to be a multi-channeled process. So it could be our posture, our vocalic, such as paralanguage, it could be kinesics, uh, our body movement. It could be haptics, touch. It could be, you know, chronemics, how we interpret time as uh, a communicative uh, function. So now that we have a, a better understanding of the comparison between verbal and nonverbal communication, let's move on. So we know that communication, nonverbal communication, is ambiguous. It's very unclear. So we see that a quivering voice may communicate nervousness, but language and symbolic communication that can tell us precisely what is causing that anxiety. So we, we listen to nonverbal cues such as, you know, a shaky voice, and we might come to the conclusion that this person is uh, nervous, where language, on the other hand, could precisely communicate our internal feelings. But, but, but just because we have a quivering voice doesn't necessarily mean that we are nervous. There could be many reasons why our voice quivers. Um, think about a smile. You know, smiles are one type of nonverbal communication that can be interpreted differently. And so a smile typically communicates happiness, friendliness, kindness, right? But some of us smile when we feel embarrassed or, 
when we are nervous, right? Um, or we laugh, you know, that, that nervous laugh. So I had a student give a speech a, a few semesters ago, and of course the student was nervous, but their, their speech was a very serious topic. I, I forget specifically the topic, but it was something that was uh, very serious. And during the presentation, the student would laugh because of their nervousness. And it, you know, it was interesting to, to, to hear such a serious topic and the student laughing in their presentation. And you know, as an audience member, it was conflicting, those messages. So you know, even though that, you know, that's a natural occurring phenomenon for the students to nav nervously laugh, that was one thing that we worked on that semester is to make sure our nonverbal behaviors are congruent with the messages that we're communicating is because we don't want to send mixed messages and cause uh, miscommunication or confusion. So we see that nonverbal communication is influenced by culture and gender. Uh, we'll go ahead and discuss a little bit later some uh, cultural variations of nonverbal behavior. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the seven universal facial expressions. So these uh, pictures on the right, uh, I did a similar presentation in grad school um, and we did an experiment and we asked participants to identify uh, these faces and the emotion that they are communicating. And so what we see with the top left picture, uh, this is me illustrating fear, right? So we, we typically see that facial expression when people are experiencing fear. This second one, this is what we call disgust. So people, you know, doesn't matter where you're at in the world, when you, ha when you take a bite in into something that's disgusting, this is typically the reaction you get. Of course, we get sadness, surprise, happiness, and anger. So these are only six of the seven universal facial expressions. So what is that seventh universal facial expression? Essentially, it's contempt. The reason why I only have six pictures is because disgust and contempt are usually similar in how they're expressed through the face. The thing is with contempt, the way I like to, to think about it or conceptualize it, it's essentially disgust directed at someone or something. You know, so it's the, the whole eye rolling. Uh, it's contemptuous behavior. It's, it's sh showing uh, disgust or disapproval. Uh, and so that's why we only have uh, six uh, pictures here. But of course, if you're Ron Weasley from Harry Potter, uh, he has more than seven universal facial expressions. So this is uh, just compilation of all the various uh, nonverbal expressions of Ron Weasley. But take a moment and see uh, if you can identify any of the seven universal facial expressions in uh, this collage. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to some of the cultural influences on nonverbal communication. So we see that several cultures view nonverbal signs differently. So for example, eye contact, that is a predominant nonverbal behavior within the Western societies. So we value eye contact. It shows that we're listening, it shows respect, all of those uh, great things. However, in African and Latin cultures, eye contact can be interpreted as a sign of aggression or sometimes considered disrespectful. Essentially, it's challenging the other person. In Asian cultures, we see that eye contact is considered inappropriate, especially between subordinates and superiors. So think about the student-professor relationship. You know, in, in, in our classroom, engaging in that eye contact really shows respect and shows that we're, you know, paying attention to each other. However, in Asian cultures, this would be inappropriate because it's a sign of challenging authority. And so it's, it's not uncommon 
to uh, in Asian communities to see individuals avoiding direct eye contact. Uh, think about how we use our hands, haptics, touch, to communicate. And so this is a picture of two international leaders holding hands, right? Now, from a Western perspective, we typically view that as a romantic sign of affection. However, in Middle East cultures, holding hands is considered a sign of deep non-romantic friendship. Think about these common nonverbal behaviors. You know, the A-OK -okay sign, right? Here, this is OK or great, um, but we see that in Japan, this could be interpreted as coin. In the US, it's, again, OK. In France, this is zero. So think about how we use our nonverbal communication to communicate about money, right? So in Japan, it's coin, but here we would probably rub our fingers and thumbs together uh, to communicate um, money. Think about the thumbs up. You know, pretty much everywhere in the world except the U.S., uh, this means uh, something derogatory. Uh, it means, you know, up yours. Uh, in the U.S., this is like, great job, right? So be mindful how you use the, the thumbs up uh, nonverbal expression when you're traveling uh, to different cultures. The peace uh, sign, this is interpreted differently depending on how you face the peace sign. So if your palm is facing away from you, this is traditionally um, interpreted as like peace. But if it's if you're showing the uh, backside of your hand away from you, so if you're showing uh, the backside, this is pretty much uh, the equivalent to the middle finger in uh, the U.S. And so, again, we want to be mindful of how we're using our nonverbal behaviors. So here are some of the gender differences the book talks about. So we see that men require more personal space. They prefer to have uh, more personal space around them. Uh, they tend to lean forward more in conversations and they are less non-verbally expressive. So uh, we maintain a baseline uh, expression when we engage in conversations. We see that uh, females tend to be more non-verbally expressive. They're better at interpreting non-verbal behavior, smile more, touch more, and stand closer to others in conversations. So these differences um, are rooted in biology, but of course, there's probably preferences that might influence how we express ourselves as well. Oh, and uh, females tend to engage in more of that eye contact. Okay, so what are the functions of nonverbal communication? So we've kind of discussed some of the characteristics, but how do our nonverbal behaviors function in our communicative interactions? Well, they can reinforce verbal messages. So smiling when greeting a friend, right? That enhances that greeting. Uh, it could be our nonverbal communication could be substitute for words such as uh, empathy. How would you show empathy to someone when you're when you don't have the right words or affection or maybe frustration? Right. So we could use our nonverbal communication for a uh, substitute of language. We can use our nonverbal behaviors to regulate interactions. So oftentimes we use conversational cues when we are trying to conclude a conversation. So we might look at a watch, we might pull out our phone, we might you know, shift our body posture so we're facing away from someone, or we might slowly start backing away uh, from the other person. And these are all conversational cues to try hinting that, okay, we're done, let's wrap it up. Of course, our nonverbal communication can provide feedback. And so when we are in conversation, so if you think about chapter one, the transactional communication model, uh, we see that both the sender and receiver are communicating simultaneously primarily because even though the listener is just receiving the message, they're still communicating their feedback through their nonverbal, right? Uh, there's a recent phenomenon that's being researched called fubbing. 
And this is when two people are interacting, but one partner is ignoring their, the, the person speaking is because they're on their phone, right? They're passively listening. So in chapter seven, next, uh, in the next chapter, we'll talk about listening. So when we have our attention placed on, on the phone, right, and someone's trying to speak to us, this is called fubbing. Um, and so, you know, whether or not we realize it or not, because our attention is, is on this device and not the person talking, that has communicative value. That's essentially telling the, the person trying to communicate to us they aren't important enough for us to put down this distraction and give them our full undivided attention. So we see that nonverbal communication is uh, providing feedback. We can use our nonverbal communication to influence others. So again, think about how you might dress in a professional context uh, because you're trying to influence other people's perceptions of your level of competency. Uh, we can influence others by using eye contact, wearing high status clothing, use open body posture, right? So instead of, you know, folding our hands or slouching or, you know, trying to make our body smaller, we could use more confident, open posture communication. Uh, we could use touch, so when appropriate. So there's a fascinating research on compliance gaining, especially how it relates to nonverbal communication. And so a light touch on a shoulder when asking for a request. So again, maybe in the office, you, uh, you know, place your hand on someone's shoulder while you ask them to uh, help you on a task. Uh, researchers have found an increase in compliance gaining, right? With, with touch, you know, uh, you know, in our in our uh, personal relationships, you know, that that is a very impactful way of uh, communicating with our loved ones. But within a professional context, always approach haptics or touch with caution. Uh, don't assume that, you know, touching someone while asking, you know, a favor or help on a project is going to be received uh, by that other person. So again, just be mindful of how you interact with people within a professional context. We could use upbeat and friendly expressions. So we see that increasing the voice or the, the, the pitch in our voice can communicate excitement, whereas if we bring it down, uh, this could uh, communicate uh, kind of a melancholy mood. Um, concealing and deceiving. So this, again, is another uh, fascinating area of research. Uh, this is uh, deception detecting. And so with our nonverbal communication, we try to conceal or deceive others, not maliciously, but it is a way of impression management. So we learned that in, what was it, chapter three, how we communicate the identity ourselves through self-disclosure. So we, if we looked at Goffman's uh, dramaturgical perspective, the front stage and the backstage, or the public self and the perceived self, we see that when we're out on public, you know, when we're out in the, the public sphere, we're on the front stage, to a certain extent, we are um, regulating our nonverbal behaviors in order to conceal or manage how people see us. So we might pretend to enjoy ourselves uh, with others we don't necessarily like, you know, so maybe at the office we put on a smile and we're like, yay, you know, I like working with you. Uh, when in reality, we don't necessarily like that person, right? But we don't want to be rude, so we uh, put a smile on our face. So this is all deceptive uh, um, uh, detecting research. And so Burgoon and Levine in 2010 uh, conducted a study and they found that we are accurately uh, slightly more than half the time. So we accurately interpret deceptive behaviors slightly more than half the time. So it's a 50-50 almost. You know, so if someone um, tells you they're really good at catching people in lies and stuff, uh, you have empirical evidence right here suggesting otherwise.
This is because we overestimate our abilities to uh, detect deception in other people's behavior. We tend to have a strong tendency to believe others. So again, we wanna believe that people are not going to lie uh, to us. And just think about the, the first part of this lecture. We believe what we see. And if there is congruency between what is said and the behavior, we are going to accept that as truth. So why do we use our nonverbal communication to conceal and deceive? Well, I think for a lot of us, we use it to hide our emotions. And sometimes when we cannot upkeep our nonverbal behaviors, uh, we get this emotional leakage, right? So the example I used earlier is like when we confront and print, confront a friend and ask them, hey, how are you? And they answer fine when they're actually not. They're trying to hide those maybe uncomfortable or difficult feelings. So managing identity. We could use our nonverbal communication to manage our uh, gender role and identity. Uh, so we have a few uh, clips here. But let's really uh, get to types of nonverbal communication. So how, you know, we, we mentioned that, you know, nonverbal communication is multi-channeled. That means we express ourselves through different, different forms. So in order to research all of these different ways of communicating through our body or non-verbally, uh, we have to create categories to make sense of everything. And so these are some of the common categories uh, within the academic literature. So kinesics, vocalics, physical appearances, proxemics, haptics, chronemics, environment or artifacts, and olfactics. So let's go ahead and break these down individually and see what they are. So kinesics is essentially body movements, how we use our body uh, and the messages that we could send. So emblems, these are movements that have direct verbal translations in a particular culture or group. So think about, you know, the, the palm up, you know, the hand in the palm facing outwards. You know, this is like a universal sign of stop. We also see that illustrators reinforce verbal messages and help visually explain what is being said, right? So, for example, if let's say I went fishing last weekend and caught a fish, I might say, I caught a fish this big, right? This would be an illustrator. It helps visually explain how big that fish uh, is. Regulators, again, are some postures or hand movements that we use to manage interactions. So again, if you're trying to stop a friend who continues to interrupt you, you might put your hand out or, you know, so forth. Adapters, these are, um, um, well, there's, there's two types of adapters that we could uh, engage in, self-adapters or object adapters. Essentially, these are behaviors to help reduce body tension or uh, relieves uh, physical or psychological uh, states. Um, so self-adapters is when we uh, uh, manipulate ourself in order to relieve uh, tension. So, you know, maybe rubbing rubbing the eyes or rubbing the back of our neck, you know, maybe massaging our temples. These are all communicating uh, that we're trying to, you know, self-soothe uh, in, in, in some way. Object adapters are essentially the same thing, but they're uh, directed towards an object. And so, a few semesters ago, again, in, in uh, COM1, one of my students gave a speech and they brought a pen up. And uh, the pen, you know, was your typical uh, pen with a clicker. And during the presentation, they were so nervous, they kept just, you know, clicking this pen as a form of reducing that, that tension, nervousness. And, you know, it just drove everyone crazy because they were just clicking away. Affect displays is how we use body movements to communicate uh, our feelings, uh, moods, and reactions. Uh, so think of uh, some 
um, automatic reactions to shocking events. So we might blush if someone embarrasses us. We might open our mouth in shock. Uh, we might, you know, um, stand really close to someone that we're interested in. So all of these affect displays could be interpreted uh, in various ways. So body language is uh, what we normally call this. That's probably the term you're most familiar with. Essentially, body language can include the ways of talking. So how we use pauses, how we stress words. It could be our posture. It could be our appearance, our head movements, such as nodding, hand movements, eye movements, facial expressions, body contact. So how we use our bodies uh, to interact with other people. It could be closeness, you know, how we use proxemics or personal space to communicate. And it could be sounds. So all of these are facets of nonverbal communication. Okay, so let's go to that next category of nonverbal communication, vocalics. I often call this paralanguage. And these are fe features of the voice other than the words themselves when used for communication. So think about not necessarily what you say, but how you say it and how that can interpret the meaning of a message. So this, so vocalics, paralanguage includes aspects of your vocal properties such as volume, pitch, tone, rate, intonation patterns, and pauses. So here on the right, I have a illustration of how paralanguage or vocalics can change the interpretation of what we say. And so if we read this statement, you see that certain words are emphasized. And so if we place more emphasis on that one word, it changes the meaning of that whole statement. So I encourage you or invite you to pause the video right now and say this out loud and place emphasis on those words and see what type of meaning uh, each one each one of those statements produces. The next thing that I would like to talk about regarding vocalics are intonation patterns. And this is the rise and the fall of our pitch during a uh, during our uh, speech and so typically what we see is towards the end of a statement we could either have a upward intonation pattern or a downward intonation pattern and one of my friends from grad school at Cal State Fullerton um, uh, Victoria she did a uh, research project looking at intonation patterns and she found that an upward or downward intonation pattern can influence people's perceived credibility. So when you hear someone talking and if they're constantly using an upward intonation pattern at the end of their statement, it kind of sounds like a question, right? So for example, intonation patterns, see how it in the, the upward intonation pattern, it kind of sounds like a question Right. Whereas downward intonation patterns uh, communicate more of a declarative authoritative message. And so uh, my friend from grad school, she found that there are gender differences in the way we use intonation patterns and that can influence the credibility of the speaker. So, again, just be mindful how you're concluding a statement because it could sound more like a question or it could sound more of a declarative statement. Okay, physical appearances. The book talks about these different aspects. Um, I'm not going to jump into uh, the physical aspects so much, but this could include attire, hairstyle, grooming, accessories, all of those uh, fun things. However, I would like to uh, share with you some interesting research that found that um, attractiveness, just, you know, how we present ourselves, um, you know, through our attire, hairstyle, grooming, accessories, how we present ourselves, our physical appearance, that attractiveness related to higher levels of sensitivity. So we tend to view attractive people or people who pre presents uh, an appealing physical appearance as more sensitive, 
uh, more kind, uh, stronger social, uh, as you know, uh, higher in sociability and interesting. So I thought that was really interesting that we associate all these characteristics to just perceived attractiveness. And if we go back to, I think it was uh, chapter four, perceptions, right? This is kind of uh, an example of that halo effect. So just because one, you know, we see one positive quality in someone, such as physical appearance, we assume they're a great person, such as they're very sensitive, they, you know, illustrate kindness and strength and sociability, we find them interesting, um, and that's, again, the, the halo effect taking place. We see clothing could also uh, communicate a number of different messages, such as economic level, uh, educational level. Uh, so, you know, the more, the, the higher you advance in your education, uh, the more you get to add to your graduation regalia, right? And so uh, you have that silly looking flat cap, you might have a sash, the gown, uh, you know, you might get a hood for your masters and then this whole like crazy different gown for, uh, you know, PhDs. Uh, so we could see education level, trustworthiness, social positions, level of uh, sophistication. So you see, you know, uh, you know, doctors or nurses wearing a particular type of uh, clothing, you know, that could communicate kind of what they do for a living. Uh, social background, educational background, level of success, and also moral characters. We see in various cultures and societies that, you know, uh, you know, either religious or special individuals within that uh, culture tend to dress in a different way to signify that they're of moral character. So proxemics, this is how, uh, essentially proxemics is defined as the regional space surrounding a person in which they regard as psychologically theirs. And so uh, this is Edwards Hall's research on proxemics. So essentially when you're standing uh, anywhere, there is a certain, uh, you know, um, space surrounding you that you claim as yours for, uh, for the moment. Uh, so we see that Hall broke up proxemics into these four different uh, spatial categories. And so we see that intimate space typically is between 0 and 18 inches. And we reserve this uh, very close proxemic for very significant others in our lives. Uh, we only grant access to that, that intimate space for a select uh, uh, people. Personal space is typically between 18 inches and four feet. So this is our arm's uh, length, uh, typically. And so again, we allow more people into our personal space, but I think in our social space, four feet to 12 feet, that's where most people reside when we're going through our daily routine. And then of course, public uh, space, this is 12 feet and beyond. So this is something that uh, you should uh, be familiar with uh, for upcoming quizzes and exams, uh, Edwards Hall's proxemics. Haptics are touch. So these are forms of touch as communication. So we see that uh, touch increases liking. It can increase compliance as we discussed. So how do we actively research touch and how people use touch to communicate. Well, some of the typology of haptics include location, so where uh, the touch is being performed, the intensity, you know, how much pressure is that? Is, you know, are you just gently placing your, your hand on top of another hand or are you squeezing it hard, right? Um, and the body part performing the touch. So this is how we break down haptics in order to understand you know, the functions and the communicative value associated with them, right? So we think of uh, kisses, right? Uh, the location, the intensity, and the body part performing. Uh, slaps or, you know, pats, handshakes, uh, you know, head, shoulder, legs, knees, right? We could look at all these different uh, body parts and, and kind of the communicative value that they have when performing uh, haptics. So I invite you to look at this video clip called The Different Types of Hugs. This is uh, hilarious and 
everyone usually gets a kick out of it. But um, that shows, you know, just different types of hugs. Okay, so moving on, we get to chronemics. This is how time is organized, used, and perceived as communication. So there are two predominant types of chronemics or categories. And so in one category, we have the monochronic chronemics. And this is essentially where societies communicate through the use of time. So they uh, tend to place a lot of emphasis on punctuality, schedules, and completing tasks on time. So think about Western societies. Uh, typically, we operate from this monochronic time orientation where we value punctuality, completing tasks on time, adhering to schedules, and so forth. In the other hand, we see polychronic societies, and these societies are more flexible when it comes to time, and they're less likely to adhere to time constraints. And so again, you can just think about how we use time to communicate. So I was always instructed, you know, it's always better to be an hour early than a minute late. And so that is you know, how I grew up. So I'm constantly early to class, to meetings, for the most part. And when people show up late, you know, I tend to jump to the conclusion that maybe, you know, this adhering to the meeting time isn't a priority for them, right? But again, that could be an inaccurate conclusion on my part is because of maybe this polychronic uh, uh, time orientation. So we see that environment and artifacts, the physical settings, architecture, interior design, cultural artifacts, all of these things have communicative value. So you think about the power structure within an office space. Typically, you know, the person, the CEO, the, the person with the most power, their office is at the top of the building. Olfactics is uh, how we use odors as a sense of uh, communication. So we see in the natural world and species, they rely heavily on odor to communicate, you know, and so even as humans, we do this as well. So this includes natural scents such as uh, pheromones. It could be fragrances, perfumes, all of those things. So at the end of this chapter, what we strive to do is increase our nonverbal competency. So, you know, skills can be divided into two categories. First, encoding, right? And this is the ability to produce and control competent nonverbal expressions. The second is decoding. And this is the ability to perceive, recall, and understand nonverbal expressions. And so, again, nonverbal competence is actively controlling how we communicate nonverbally and also increasing our ability to accurately interpret or perceive other people's nonverbal behaviors, right? So we know that we're, you know, interpreting accurately other people's nonverbal communication can be difficult because nonverbal communication is inherently ambiguous. However, recognizing, you know, when someone looks sad or concerned or confused, you know, being able to recognize those nonverbal uh, cues and ask them, you know, engage in that perception checking process, you know, go up to this person and say, hey, I noticed that you look a little bit confused. Am I reading into it? Was I way off in my interpretation? What's going on? And so forth. So being able to spot those nonverbal communications and engage in that perception checking process can help open up an environment to have conversations about the way people are expressing themselves through non-linguistic means. So in conclusion, I would like to bring up this reminder. Nonverbal communication is highly ambiguous. So keep that in mind that just because someone is behaving the way that they are doesn't necessarily mean we can jump to conclusions or interpret their behavior accurately. So this brings me to this quote. 
and this quote is what I'll use to end today's presentation, and that is, don't trust what you see. Even salt looks like sugar. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.